This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1987, Whitville, Virginia was deluged by an unprecedented wave of UFO sightings. For newsman Danny Gordon, the man at the center of the storm, the sightings began a series of threatening phone calls and break-ins, which made him regret that he ever went public with the story. When a newspaper reporter in Ohio began researching several unconnected murders, he had no idea that his investigation would take him into a dark and dangerous subculture and put him on the trail of a possible serial killer. Seventy years ago, a man named Bill Beatty had a vision. He would build a magnificent castle in the rolling hills of New Jersey. Today, many people believe they have seen his ghost roaming the grounds, unable and unwilling to leave his masterpiece. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. During the past five years, Unsolved Mysteries has broadcast a number of stories dealing with unidentified flying objects. Viewed in retrospect, they chronicle the history of UFO sightings in America and Europe. Today, most of us take tales of UFO sightings for granted, yet the phenomenon was virtually unheard of until just after World War II. Nineteen forty-seven, the genesis of UFO sightings unfolded in the New Mexico desert near Roswell Army Air Base. Military investigators were called in to examine the debris of an unknown aircraft. The incident was thoroughly documented and even publicized. Incredibly, a few eyewitnesses claimed that alien life forms were also recovered. Ultimately, the authorities denied the entire affair and insisted the UFO was nothing more than a downed weather balloon. Eighteen years later, in 1965, residents of a small Pennsylvania village observed a fiery object streak through the sky, then fall to Earth. Many witnesses saw an Air Force radar squadron hauling the object away. The military dismissed the sighting as a meteorite and insisted that nothing was ever recovered. Over the next 25 years, reports of close encounters proliferated, many of them on or near military bases. One of the most remarkable occurred on December 26, 1980, at Bentwaters, an American air base in England. definitely something up there. A beam is coming down from an object to the ground near our feet. According to eyewitnesses, the sightings continued in various forms until December 28th. The next day, a continent away in Texas, a woman named Betty Cash suffered severe radiation burns. She claimed she had been exposed to the energy field of a bizarre flying object. Most recently, between 1989 and 1991, thousands of people in Belgium reported a literal invasion of strange unearthly crafts. Amazingly, the Belgian Air Force is able to capture, on radar, the swift and erratic movements of an unidentified craft which defied the laws of known physics.
For those of us who've never encountered a UFO, reports of such events often sound far-fetched. In fact, some eyewitnesses who go public risk becoming the object of ridicule and scorn. Others are simply ignored. In either case, an acknowledged UFO sighting can profoundly change a person's life in ways that he or she never imagined possible. Worthville, Virginia, population 8,000, is nestled in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Country music station WYVE calls itself the voice of Withville. On most days, life here is peaceful, unpretentious, and uneventful, but that was about to change. Good morning, Sheriff. Danny Gordon. On October 7, 1987, radio reporter Danny Gordon checked in, as usual, with a county sheriff and heard an unbelievable tale. Over near um, Austinville. Huh? All right. Got anything else? You're kidding me. Three Wythe County Sheriff's deputies, all former military men, well, who... claimed they had seen a UFO. Well, when was that? OK, Danny, you're on in three, two, one. Unidentified flying objects have been sighted over Wythe County on Monday and Tuesday evenings. The Wythe County Sheriff's Department... There was a filler piece that came on at the end of the news, which I usually relegate to something that's maybe unusual, like we had a one police officer had killed five chickens once with uh, two shots, and that was a story that ran as kind of a ha-ha piece. And this was another ha-ha piece, and being a very skeptical newsman, it was definitely not uh, in my lead part of my news. Danny Gordon's fluff story sparked unprecedented listener reaction. Reports of UFO sightings poured into WYVE. With a switchboard jammed, Gordon finally set up a special call-in program for the evening of October 19th, 1987. Hello, this is Danny Gordon. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. What follows is based on verbatim transcripts of the actual telephone calls. It was very, very huge. It was long and it didn't have any sound. It had a big light on the front, one in the center, and one in the back. Well, it kind of looked something about like an egg shape to me. What we could see was red, green, and white, sort of flashing lights. Um, we saw a uh, plane go by with, you know, red, red flashing lights. We knew it wasn't a jet of any sort. OK, well, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Well, being a brass tax journalist, I always believe there is a plausible, logical explanation. And I felt at that time that it was military of some nature and that we would find the reason in a short period of time. Danny Gordon thought the UFOs are most likely experimental aircraft being tested out of Virginia's Langley Air Force Base. But he was repeatedly told by the military that there was no testing going on. As more and more residents had sightings, the military did come up with one explanation. Everybody had been telling us that what people were seeing were planes refueling. And so I said, well, I didn't know that's how they did that. And then I thought, well, why are they doing that down over my house? You know, isn't this something they should be doing away from populated areas? I called the Pentagon and talked to the Air Force uh, general there who told me if they were refueling under 13,000 feet, then somebody's butt's in a sling. And to this day, we don't know if they were refueling at 5,000 feet. But at the same time, I have asked, if it is military, then I'll back off the story and leave it alone if you tell me because I'm a patriot. And each time I'm told it's not us, we're not doing it, and we haven't been doing it. On October 21st, just two weeks after the original report, Danny Gordon and a friend, Roger Hall, drove to the area south of Withville where most of the sightings had occurred. They brought along a 35 millimeter still camera, as well as a video camera. We were headed home after two hours of fruitless searching, about a quarter to nine on Route 21 South coming into Withville, and just happened to look to my left and saw a, a very unusual object coming across the horizon. What's that? What? Over there, some, some lights or something. I'm gonna pull over. I pulled off to the side of the road in a hurry, 
jumped out. He got out of the, the right side, and as he got out, I noticed the craft was coming at me. It was very large. It had a dome shaped to the top of it, had no wings, and had what appeared to be a strobe putting out multicolored lights on the right side of the craft. What the hell is that? I don't know. It was probably less than a thousand feet away and a thousand feet high at the maximum. We guessed it'd be in at least uh, two football fields in diameter. You could see three huge, looked like picture windows in the back of it that were lit from the inside out. As I watched the sky, from the left came a red ball. As the big mothership went into a small skiff of clouds, the red ball docked with the craft. It was like you were watching a computer game and watching these things develop on the video screen. Did you get a picture of that? No, didn't you? I left the camera on the trunk. Where's your camera? In the car. I was driving. We looked at each other and realized no pictures. The camera was not in my hand, the camera was not in his hand, and we both knew we blew it. The only thing I can say is we were just all struck by it or, or just dumb, whichever one. I'm not sure which, but we sure didn't get any pictures of it. The next night, Gordon and Hall would go out again. This time, they would take photographs. With the film still undeveloped, a press conference was called for the following day, October 23, 1987. The night before the press conference, I received a phone call from somebody who refused to identify himself, and they said that I needed to be aware that the CIA and the federal government were very much interested in the with kind of UFOs. I started to wonder what I had stepped into, and my wife was urging me to uh, back off, to leave it alone, and uh, I also was receiving some anonymous phone calls saying, you know, it's something you need to leave it alone because it's not for your place to be messing in defense matters. Becky? After the press conference, Gordon discovered that his house had been broken into. Becky? Oddly, nothing was stolen, and Gordon is convinced that someone was looking for the photographs. When developed, the pictures revealed only vague streaks of light in the sky. But Danny Gordon would soon have another opportunity to photograph the UFOs. Six weeks later, on December 2nd, Danny, his wife, and daughter were leaving the local mall when they encountered some unexpected visitors. We uh, looked very quickly and saw what I thought was one large object, which later appeared to be four, uh, flying uh, disc shapes. As soon as the objects were photographed, they disappeared from view. When the pictures came out, and they had a lot of grain, but they showed definite four shapes of objects in the sky. But the most impressive point in the four photographs, the objects appear to change shape or light formations within one click of the camera. They go from a teardrop shape to a uh, round ball shape, then they go to a flying saucer-like disc shape, and then they go to the edge shape as they go out of sight. The people of Withville knew that something extraordinary was happening in their town. By the end of December, the sightings numbered well over 1,500. One of the first occurred here, near Interstate 81, a mile from downtown Withville. Eyewitnesses said the craft resembled a brilliantly lit whirling carousel. Immediately, other sightings cropped up. I'm not mistaken about what we saw, absolutely not, because we'd never seen this before. We didn't have any reason to make any stories up. I kept a journal. Patricia Akers had 10 sightings, all of them here, eight miles north of Withville. The best way I can describe them is that they look, sort of look like a cross between a helicopter and an airplane with no noise, no, or very little noise. And to be so large, I don't know how they stayed up. 
I'd say that the educated uh, psychologists and uh, psychiatrists that's debunking what we've seen and everything, they've never been here. They've never seen it. Uh, I was skeptic until I started seeing this stuff. Rita Marie Vaught saw a UFO behind this ridge half a mile from her house. I've seen the circle of object in the sky, all different colors that kept going around and around. It would be sort of looking like a carousel, but uh, it didn't scare me. None of this has scared me. Uh, until I see the little green men walking around, I won't be scared. You just had this feeling of something really, really big just moving, just drifting over your head and no sound or anything. Mary Jane Williamson's so sightings that. occurred directly above her house in the center of Withville. It had all the white lights in the front, just a big semicircle of white lights, and it was just huge. I mean, it was just absolutely huge. But you couldn't actually see an outline or anything like that. I know it wasn't the planet Venus, and I know it was not atmospheric phenomena. These were some kind of craft moving over our house. Eventually, I got around to calling the Pentagon and talk with the spokesman for defense of the Pentagon. And he, he speaks for all the defense uh, uh, branches. And he told me, quote, twice, we do not deny UFOs exist. The government confirms they exist, but we deny they pose a threat to the populace of Wythe County. And my question was, how do you know this? And he said, I can't tell you, but there's no threat to you. So that's the reason we're not sending convoys of aircraft down there to protect with County. On March 19th, 1988, Danny Gordon was packing for a broadcaster's conference in Virginia Beach, where he was to speak about his UFO coverage. I received a phone call at home from a retired military intelligence officer. And first he told me to make sure that I taped the conversation so he could put the date and everyone to be aware. And I said, why do you want to tape this? And he said, I want your friends to know something happens to you that I forewarned you. What I'm telling you, Danny, is uh -huh. I've been suing this thing for many, many years. Like I say, I saw my son die of leukemia. He told me that because of his investigations into the UFO field, that they had hit his son and caused his son to die with a, some kind of virus connected to leukemia. Danny, who is it? It's nothing. He said that he had information to the federal government, was not very happy with my UFO investigations. And they felt like I was too uh, loud of a voice to quieten by just killing me, which made me very happy. And he said, they want to quieten you in a different fashion. What I'm telling you, they will try to hit you if they think it's practical for their purposes to keep you from further investigating this thing. And then most likely it would be done through skin contact chemicals. It be something on the doorknob of your car steering wheel. They could also come up with something, do something to your children. You know, it's one thing for someone to threaten myself. When you threaten my family, you're trading on very thin water. So I, when I found out that he could be believed, just could be, it, it scared me at the same time made me mad because I had to try to protect my family, protect myself, and at the same time, because I, am a, I believe in free speech, I was refusing to allow this man to stop me from going to Virginia Beach to talk. Well, I'm going to Virginia Beach. How many times you think I'm going to crack my heart? No, I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you for calling. What was that about? Oh, nothing, honey. Oddly enough, it was the same weekend that there was a hepatitis epidemic in Virginia Beach. Had I come down with hepatitis, I would have believed and everyone would have believed they had gotten to me. But I came back with no problems and the children were in good shape. Less than one month after the disturbing phone call, Gordon had two surprise visitors at his home. My associate Michael, we're with the Richmond Gazette. Uh -huh. I'd like to ask you a few questions if you don't mind about these recent UFO settings. No, that'd be fine. That'd be fine. Okay, great. They remained for approximately 45 minutes one interviewing Danny Gordon, the other roaming through the house, snapping photographs. They had told me when they left, they would send me a copy of the article so I could peruse it. And when I didn't receive one, I called the newspaper and they said, well, these two guys are not on our payroll. They don't work for us. So who they were, I don't know, but they were in my house, saw my pictures, saw my negatives, talked to my family, took pictures and then left but they, they were not with the newspaper. I think we've got uh, everything we need, Mr. Gordon. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you. A few weeks later, Danny Gordon sat down to organize and catalog his UFO photographs. When I got to the canister which had the UFO negatives, I quickly opened it up and found some UFO negatives, but the one negative with the shots from the shopping mall was missing. And I felt like maybe there was something in those photographs that I was not seeing. So I took the photographs to some other people to look at we used magnifying glasses, we looked, we measured angles, trying to find out why these photographs were so important. And we've yet to discover why anyone would want to steal that one Pacific set of four in a series of photographs of the UFOs. Danny Gordon had nearly reached the end of his rope. His house had been broken into. He had received countless late night phone calls, some of them threatening. Bogus reporters had visited his home Finally, his UFO negatives disappeared. Two months later, the stress caught up with Danny Gordon. Somebody help me, please. What's going on? He just keeled over. He was getting ready for work. I think he's having a heart attack. How are you doing, sir? What happened? Not so well. Doctors would later determine that the attack had been brought on not by heart problems, but by severe exhaustion. Danny Gordon was cautioned that continued involvement with the UFO controversy could jeopardize his health. I myself have not had a sighting since December of 1990, but purposely I don't go out and look because it's upset my life enough I would just as soon never see a UFO again in my lifetime. If I had my choice, I'd not report the UFO story again. It's just been too hard on my life and created too many problems. Don't look up, because once you look up and you tell somebody what you saw, your life is changed forever. In late 1987, Danny Gordon received an average of 500 telephone calls about UFOs each month. Today, the calls have dwindled to approximately 50 per month. The UFO heyday in Withville is apparently drawn to a close. Danny Gordon's health and life are back to normal. But if history is any indicator, sometime soon in another small town, someone else will look up, and his or her life will never be the same. Next, in Ohio, a reporter's curiosity leads to a statewide hunt for a possible serial killer. On April 19, 1990, the partially nude body of a woman was found behind a truck stop in Licking County, Ohio. She had been beaten to death. All of her jewelry and some articles of clothing were missing. About the bruising on the eye. Despite an extensive investigation by county sheriffs, the victim was never identified. No one was aware that her murder was not an isolated case. Four years earlier, the body of this woman, 23-year-old Shirley Dean Taylor, was found behind a traffic barrier on Interstate 71 in nearby Medina County. Taylor, a known prostitute, had also been beaten to death. Let's get her down to the county morgue. As in the case of the Jane Doe, all jewelry and several pieces of clothing had been removed from the body. No one would connect the nearly identical murders until 1990. In November of that year, Michael Behrens, a reporter for the Columbus Dispatch, began preliminary research for a possible story on serial killers. I had remembered a statement that an FBI agent had once said that prostitutes make the ideal serial killer victim because they're transient and often their disappearances aren't reported immediately. So I started looking at prostitute deaths all across Ohio, primarily using newspaper stories as the way to track those deaths. Barons began to cross-reference unsolved murder cases in Ohio. A sinister pattern soon emerged. Eight women in eight different counties had been beaten or strangled to death. 
Each was found alongside a major interstate. Each was a known or suspected prostitute. All these women who were killed in Ohio also worked at truck stops or were last believed to have been working at a truck stop. And that was the third major factor that started tying these deaths together. Michael Behrens began an investigation that took him into a little known subculture of Ohio's interstate truck stops. You drive by them and you see these, these restaurants and these trucks, but until you sit there, you don't see what the underbelly, the underworld of these little yeah. mini cities that form each night and then break apart each morning and come together. See you next time, sweetie. Yeah, you take care. Bears discovered a flourishing sex for sale industry at truck stops throughout the state. On any given night, any number of women were available. The prostitutes work mm -hmm. off a CB radio, and it's all done anonymously. The, the prostitute will get on the radio and give her handle and some little catchphrase that she's developed as her trademark, and the truck will answer back and say, yeah, this is the Blue Peter built in row three. Come meet me. And she goes off to the truck, and then usually once she gets in the truck, she'll use the trucker's CB to radio to her next customer. 27-year-old Anna Marie Patterson was a sixth known victim in reviewing the investigation of her murder, Michael Barron's uncovered several possible clues to the killer's identity. Hey there, guys. This is uh, Sleeping Beauty. If you're looking for a good time, come back. On February 8th, 1987, Anna Marie was working at a truck stop in Austintown, Ohio, uh, hey guys, 150 miles north of Columbus. According to witnesses, just after midnight, Anna Marie answered a call from a driver of a black or dark blue Peterbilt truck. The man used the CB handle, Dr. No. Hey, how you doing? Sleeping beauty? Ah, uh, sure enough. Come on up. How you doing tonight? Great. Oh my God, it's freezing out there. Uh, don't you worry, I'll warm you up. 25 days later, Anna Marie's body was found alongside Interstate 71, north of Cincinnati. Anna Marie was found about 250 miles from where she was last seen, uh, in a field, in a drainage uh, ditch, in about uh, four to six inches of water. Her head had been bashed in, and she was brutally beaten. She wasn't just killed, she was mutilated, in essence. Sleeping bag has a body of a white, Anna Marie had a rule of only staying in the truck stop and would not allow a trucker to take her off the stop. That's why it's believed that she was probably killed or at least knocked unconscious at the stop. At the time of her death, Anna Marie Patterson was six months pregnant. An autopsy revealed that she had been killed within 48 hours of her disappearance. The condition of her body clearly indicated that the killer had kept it refrigerated for nearly a month. There has been some speculation that some of these victims have been driven many more miles than the actual distance from last seen to found. There may be an indication that the killer is doing something with these victims, either verbally, physically, or otherwise, after death. According to Barron's, the killing spree began with the murder of an unidentified woman in April of 1981. Over the next nine years, the bodies of seven other victims were dumped along interstates in different counties. Each woman was viciously beaten or strangled to death. Each had jewelry and clothing removed from her body. The conclusion we reached is that there was overwhelming evidence that a potential serial killer was trolling Ohio interstates in search of victims, and not only Ohio, but many different Midwest states and even going to the East Coast. We thought the evidence was overwhelming to present that to the public. On March 10th, 1991, the Columbus Dispatch ran Michael Barron's story. It detailed compelling evidence which suggested the murders of the eight women were the work of one killer. 10 days later, the Ohio Attorney General and the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association formed a special task force they established a 24-hour toll-free hotline as part of an unprecedented statewide investigation. We were finding that uh, what was happening in one county was not necessarily being told to another county. And a clue in one county that may have meant nothing 
uh, may have meant a great deal in just the adjacent county. What may be the most significant clue in this case is also the most perplexing. Killers tend to dump in places that they feel comfortable with. That's why you'll find a grouping of bodies in a river or such. This killer scatters these bodies, and that's the big question, why? There have been great speculation among the officers themselves as do we really have an intelligent killer out there who knows enough about law enforcement to have dumped the bodies in these different jurisdictions? There's even been speculation that the killer could be a security guard or even a former police officer who knows enough about police investigative techniques to do that. Michael Barnes is convinced that one killer is responsible for the eight murders. He is equally convinced that the victims were all doomed by their occupation. I think the killer no doubt picked prostitutes because he knows that it does affect the quality of investigation. Prostitutes aren't going to be pursued as aggressively as if it was a child or a suburban housewife. That's a fact of life, and I think everyone would agree to that. I think that the public has compassion for anybody who was innocently murdered, no matter what their profession, no matter how they live their life. When someone's life is snuffed out for absolutely no reason, I think people get angry. The last known victim in Ohio was discovered in November of 1990. However, authorities have been stunned to learn of as many as 150 other homicides nationwide that fit the same basic pattern. Recently, truck drivers have been arrested in three separate murder investigations. In each case, the victims were prostitutes. But none of these suspects has been connected to any of the Ohio murders. At least two of the victims were last seen getting into a black or dark blue Peterbilt tractor, possibly pulling a refrigerated trailer. The driver may use a CB handles Dr. No, Stargazer, or Dragon. I'd like to be able to say that we know now whether it's one person and whether it's a serial murder. The truth is that we don't. Uh, and while that is uh, certainly a plausible theory, at this point, it's nothing more than that. Stay tuned, an elegant mansion in New Jersey is said to be haunted by the ghost of its builder. Do ghosts really exist? The fact is that 25% of all Americans today believe they do. Perhaps ghosts are no more than our own need for something beyond the world we can touch and feel and logically comprehend. Or perhaps, as one family in New Jersey believes, they're really out there. In 1923, a man named Bill Beatty had a dream. He imagined a 17th century Norman castle rising stone by stone on 150 acres of woodland in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Everything's coming along just fine. We've completed work on the kitchen and the basement. And Bill the Beatty had the means to make his dream come true. As an advertising time. executive in New York so City, the, uh, he had amassed a sizable fortune. His wife, Sarah, was wealthy in her own right. Anything with the window until the oak comes in. It's well, gonna, when's the oak coming? It's going to take two or three days. This is the window I was talking about. The Beattys envisioned their castle as a center of an artist colony, surrounded by bungalows fronting a man-made lake. How, uh, how far up are we going to go? We're going to go up another foot, OK? And you're going to have five, you're going to have 11 by five. In 1930, before construction was complete, the Beatties moved into the castle with their four children. But Bill Beatty would never see the completion of his dream. Just one year later, he died at the age of 45, a victim of influenza. His castle would not be finished for another five years. Sarah Beatty never remarried. She raised all four children in the castle and lived there until 1941. From 1945 to 1971, the castle was occupied by two different boys' schools. From the start, students and teachers reported eerie organ music echoing through the corridors. Oddly, the school owned no pipe organ. 
However, the long-dead Bill Beatty had owned one. Was it possible that Bill Beatty loved his castle so much that he refused to leave even in death? Old timers remember that Sarah Beatty often held seances trying to communicate with Bill. When the second boys' school moved out of the castle, many of the faculty and students remain convinced the premises were haunted. In 1972, Don and Carol Burlingame bought the castle and began to remodel. They would soon learn about the ghost in residence firsthand. Carol was really the first one to, to feel some sort of present. And she had a friend that was sort of an amateur parapsychologist. And we brought her in, and she said, well, there definitely is a presence here. He's definitely friendly, and he's male. And Carol said, well, maybe we should try to get rid of him. Shouldn't we have a, a seance? And, and, uh, and she said, no, you better leave things exactly the way they are. He's friendly, he's happy, uh, let it go at that. After the brooding games moved in, hammering noises resounded through the hallways and disembodied footsteps trod the stairs. Before long, the ghost made his presence known in other, more high-tech ways. What's going on? I don't know. Yeah, it's featuring sports. Let me see if I can fix it. You just get into a movie, just the really interesting part, and all of a sudden the station would change. It would go from two to three to four to five. And it happened more than one time. I knew that there was a presence here. But what I couldn't figure out was why was he here? Who was he? When was he going to leave? If, in fact, was he ever going to leave? Um, I just, it was something I couldn't figure out. The Burlingames began to delve into the history of the castle. Soon Eugene Melville, who is now 78 years old, turned up. He had worked for Sarah Beatty from 1933 to 1937 and had his own remarkable tale of encountering the ghost. I said to him what I see in there, and they said they sensed something themselves, but they never seen him. But I have felt him there a lot, even though I, I've only seen him that once. I can truthfully say that was the only time I ever laid eyes on him, was that once. Doesn't seem to be under here, Mrs. B. Why don't you... It was 1934, three years after Bill Beatty's death. Eugene Melville was helping Sarah search for a bracelet which had been lost during a family gathering. But he's there, Mrs. Blue. But it was a figure no. of a man standing there. No. It didn't stay long there for me to examine it very good. It was just going just like that. It was scary. I don't know about this. It frightened the daylights out of me. He's back. And I never seen him again. I just never wanted to go in that balcony. I never went in there again. It bothered me. I passed by it. But to get me in there, to stand there, oh, forget it. I wouldn't go in there. Don and Carol Burlingame finally understood that they shared their home with a ghost of Bill Beatty. They believe that on one occasion, Bill demonstrated how much he cared about the castle. We decided we were going to go off for a little ride, and Carol was sort of a fresh air fiend, so she had all the windows open in the, in the servant's wing where we were living. And Don said, you better close all the windows, it's supposed to rain. I said, no, it's not going to rain, don't worry about it, I'm leaving them all open. So I left them open, we went out, and it rained. We came home and all of the casement windows, which opened from the inside and opened to the inside, were all closed and latched. How wet did it get? It didn't. There's no water on the floors. Everything's fine, and the windows are closed. Well, how's that possible? I don't know. So there wasn't a drop of rain in the house. So our only conclusion was, because there's no other way for them to have been closed, is that Bill helped us out when he saw the rain coming. He closed all the windows and gave us a hand. From that day on, Bill Beatty's ghost was a constant presence in the Berlin Games' lives. Bill and I have an agreement. 
I chatted with him one day, because I didn't see him, but I chatted with him anyhow, and I said, Bill, you can stay here for as long as you want. I enjoy having you around. You don't bother me. Just don't ever let me see you, because if I do see you, I'll probably wind up in a padded cell somewhere. So you're welcome to stay, just don't materialize. And he never has. We've had several experiences in the house, one of which was I have a habit of leaving the bread out, because it's handy. And I'd leave it out somewhere, and the next thing I'd turn around, it would be on the floor. I was alone in the kitchen, the bread was on the counter. There was no way that it could have fallen off by itself. And when it did fall off, or fly off, uh, it was, it, it went a considerable distance, so I know that someone had to have moved it. There was no one else there with me at all, no animals, Don wasn't around, and there was no way the bread could have fallen off the counter because it was set square. Okay, Bill, that's enough. Knock it off. And that led me to believe that Bill had to be there saying, hi, I'm here. There was just no way that that bread could have fallen off the counter by itself. In 1986, the Brooding Games invited Dr. Michaeline Mayer, a noted parapsychologist, to visit the castle. Mayer, along with an assistant, conducted a series of tests for paranormal activity. Our physical instruments were not able to detect anything unusual. But in this particular case, the sheer volume of the reports adds to the credibility of the case. People have experienced similar phenomena when living at the castle, even though these are people who may never have spoken to each other. One of our witnesses in this case, um, a particularly credible witness, in fact, a, a professional person of some stature, uh, reported seeing uh, in the driveway in front of the castle a person who dissipated right in front of his eyes. Can I help you? Who are you? I think the big news here is that human persons can act as sensors. And uh, when we quantitatively evaluate their responses, we find that we cannot uh, dismiss this evidence as caused by coincidence. Well, the okay. stair treads are going up on that second floor. OK, come on. You're the right. key to existing with a ghost is if you can accept it, you can enjoy it. And when things happen, you just write them off as, oh, it must be the ghost or it must be Bill, if you know who it, happen to know who it is, as in our case, we do. And you can have fun with it. I firmly believe he will never leave the castle. Uh, the love of the thing maybe got the better of, of his soul. And I think that's the thing got such power, you know, is the soul. It's eternal. It's been said that the spirits of those who die with unfinished business are destined to wander for eternity. This would seem to be the case with Bill Beatty, in 1991, after nearly two decades in the castle, the Berlin Games moved away. As far as they know, the ghost of Bill Beatty stayed behind. The Berlin Games hope that when the castle is next sold, its new owners will enjoy the ghost presence as much as they did. Join me next time for an all-new edition of Unsolved Mysteries.